I suspect that many of you would know the term junkie. A junkie is someone who's addicted to drugs. Medically, such addictions are defined in terms of the brain mechanisms they activate, a dependence on the regular release of dopamine. Sadly, I too am a junkie. As a result of my addiction, I've neglected my friends, I've failed to spend enough time with my family, and like all junkies, I've wasted a lot of money on feeding my habit. I am a science junkie. If I am to be happy, I need my daily dose of science, my daily fix of science-driven dopamine. On the rare days I don't get my fix, I become sad and sullen, and even my dog avoids me. Now, I don't want you thinking that I'm claiming to be some great scientist. I'm not. I'm only an amateur scientist, not a trained professional scientist like most of you. But this also gives me an advantage, an edge, because I get to mess with every area of science, every branch of science that interests me, rather than specializing in just one area. I guess most people will think of me as a taxonomist or perhaps a biologist, but I'm just as happy messing about with physics or agriculture or psychology or medical research. For 10 hours a day, every day, in sickness and in health, I'm playing with science. I'm 66 now, and the problem is only becoming worse. My wife says that I should be seeing a doctor. The trouble is that I tend to see everything through the lens of science. And as you know already, science is all about the skeptical testing of hypotheses. So whenever I hear a claim such as organic food is better for you, I treat it skeptically as a hypothesis. I try to gather the evidence for and against and see where it leads. Do people who eat organic food have better health outcomes than people who eat, well, food? It turns out that no, they don't. There's no difference. But there's a problem with this scientific, this skeptical approach to life. It is that it leaves little room for our spiritual well-being. I'm sure you all know about the placebo effect. For example, you could test whether papaya leaf extract actually helps to increase platelet count in dengue patients. So you randomly divide a large group of dengue patients into two and give one group a capsule of papaya leaf extract and the other group a capsule of some substance known to be harmless, say gelatin. This way you find out whether the papaya extract is more effective at treating dengue than nothing at all. And what do you know? It works. Papaya leaf extract does increase platelet count. But the funny thing is, the placebo effect is, that a few of the patients who were given the gelatin too show increased platelet counts. The placebo effect is the foundation of the industries we know as homeopathic medicine and complementary medicine. Prospective, randomized, double-blinded studies rarely show these medical traditions to be any better than placebo. These painstaking studies help us to differentiate the drugs that work from the drugs that don't. It's how we show that when it comes to COVID at least, that Dhammika Pania is no different from, well, the Kittal Pania. And it is in that same spirit of skeptical inquiry that we should evaluate statements like this. And it isn't only Sri Lankans who get carried away with these silly miracle cures. It's people all over the world. And then, famously of course, there's Dr. Anuruddha Padenia. Some of you might have seen the video I did about his claims that we're all being poisoned by agrochemicals. I think it was in large measure his influence that led to the ban on agrochemicals last year, resulting in the collapse of agriculture and the downfall of our economy. Why are doctors so bad at science? First off, we need to acknowledge that it isn't because they're stupid or dim-witted. After all, only the brightest biology stream students are selected for medicine. And Dr. Pardenia did not only medicine, but he became a consultant, a postgraduate medical specialist. My guess is that to become a doctor, you need an IQ of at least 120, bearing in mind that national IQ in Sri Lanka seems to be around 87, but I'll come to that in a bit. Well, I have a hypothesis for why doctors have problems with science. This isn't a Sri Lankan phenomenon only. 
If you look at the list of Nobel Prize winners in physiology or medicine, you'll be surprised to find that a large majority of them didn't do medicine as a first degree. Here's the list over a 10 year period. And you can see that there are only four who are doctors at all, and only two whose first degree was in medicine. My guess is that in their training, doctors have to be deliberately prevented from doing the one thing that scientists are encouraged to do. They are prevented from experimenting. A doctor is trained to do two things, to diagnose a disease and then prescribe the approved treatment for that disease. A doctor who practices medicine as if he were a scientist through experimentation could end up killing his or her patients. We don't want that. That is why prospective randomized double-blinded studies have become the cornerstone, the gold standard of medical research, because they work. And no claim in medical science can be accepted as valid unless it has withstood the scrutiny of such a study. But these are expensive to conduct, and they are painfully slow. We saw this when it came to evaluating the various COVID vaccines, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and so on. I know I'm getting sidetracked here, but because this is probably still fresh in your memory, I want to deal with one further aspect of these trials. And that is the ethical aspect because it gives you plenty of opportunities for affordable research and because you may not have thought about this before. As you know, the pandemic brought the world to a standstill. <clears throat> it was really urgent to get a vaccine out as soon as possible. But once the vaccines were developed, they had to be tested. In the case of the Pfizer vaccine, a cohort of 43,000 participants were randomly divided into two groups. But of course, they had to ensure that age and sex and race and ethnicity, body mass index, and the so-called comorbidities such as diabetes were evenly distributed across the two groups. One group, about 21,000 people, received the actual mRNA vaccine, and the other group received a placebo injection. Neither the patients nor the staff who administered the injections knew what was in the vial. This is why such studies are referred to as double-blinded. And then these people were told to go about their normal lives for four months. Among the placebo group, 162 people got COVID. And of the group that received the actual vaccine, only eight got it. So the vaccine turned out to be 95% effective in preventing COVID-19. But while this trial was progressing for a painfully long four months, tens of thousands of people were dying of COVID every day. So was there a way of speeding up the process? Of course there was, but with a catch. Rather than selecting a massive cohort of 43,000 people and monitoring them for four months, what if you took just 100 volunteers and gave them the vaccine and then deliberately infected each one of them with COVID-19. As a control, you could take another 100, give them a placebo injection, and then deliberately infect them with the virus as well. That way, you'd have your answer in just a few days rather than in four months, saving hundreds of thousands of lives. But this isn't considered ethical. It wouldn't be considered ethical even if you carefully explained the risks beforehand and offered each volunteer, say, a fee of a million dollars. But if I asked you to tell me why it isn't ethical, I think you might struggle to answer. After all, isn't it better for a handful of well-paid volunteers to die than allowing 100,000 innocent people to get COVID and die? More than 6 million people have died of COVID-19 up to now. But our system of ethics doesn't allow us to incentivize even a small number of well-compensated volunteers to be deliberately infected and risk death in order to save millions. This is a moral dilemma that has been widely investigated. In its simplest form, you could present it as what is known as the runaway train problem or the trolley problem. Here you see a train hurtling down a track that is about to divide. 
if the train goes straight, it will kill the five red people standing on the track. But if it is diverted to the right, it will kill only one, the blue person. Now you are the green person standing beside the control lever. You have the power to let the train go straight on and kill five people or divert it to the right and kill one person. What will you do? Well, some of you will opt for going right and killing the one person. Others will choose to do nothing and let five people die. Now let's complicate it a bit. Would your judgment change if the red people were your sisters or your brothers? Or if the blue person was your son or your daughter? Would it change your mind if the people were of a different race or if they were ugly? Or if they were of the same religion as you or went to the same school as you? Would your judgment change if there were people close by shouting at you, urging you to do one thing or the other? As the vaccine trial shows, such ethical and moral problems do really exist in the world and they don't have easy answers. But they're really hard for a reason. It's because we really have problems applying science and logic to making moral and ethical judgments. These problems are important because they define who we are and they're important because they help us to guide our society in ever better directions. I think such problems are relevant to us because they could help us identify the causes for Sri Lanka becoming a failed state. We often blame politicians for everything that's wrong with the country, but perhaps the problem lies with us, the people. I'll give you an example that supports that view in a minute. The field of experimental psychology offers huge opportunities to change social behavior for the better. And it is a field in which great experiments could be done cheaply in Sri Lankan universities with potentially internationally relevant results. The British Cabinet Office has a division called the Nudge Unit. It was inspired by the work of the economist Richard Thaler, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2017. Thaler's work was on choice architecture, how people make simple choices, and how those choices could be influenced unconsciously to make people's lives better. The Nudge Unit has done some wonderful work over the past 12 years to change public behaviors. So how could we use a Nudge Unit in Sri Lanka to help us perform better as a nation? That's something I'd like you to think about. Let's take the simple problem of blood donation. When you tear it down to its basic form, blood donation is what is known as a public goods game. Most of us never receive a blood transfusion in our lives but most of us feel that blood donation is an ethical and moral necessity. After all, we never know when we might need surgery or have an accident or get a cancer and need a blood transfusion. So it's vital that the blood bank, the National Blood Transfusion Service, be well stocked with blood. But then, very, very few of us actually donate blood on a regular basis. Even though donations have been increasing, the rate of donation represents only about 2% of the population. And because many donors give blood multiple times a year, public participation is actually much less than even 2%. But in most Western countries, blood donation per capita is typically 300% higher than in Sri Lanka. In countries such as Austria, France and Greece, more than half of all adults give blood at least once a year. But what are the moral and ethical values that underpin blood donation? It can't be religion, because people in developed Western countries are rapidly abandoning religion. In Sri Lanka, on the other hand, more than 90% of us say that religion plays an important role in our daily lives. Buddhists in particular think of blood donation as meritorious yet they give blood much less willingly than atheists. What's more, in all these countries, including Sri Lanka, no one is paid to give blood. How then can we nudge our fellow citizens to give more blood? What is it about our way of life that prevents us from being positive participants in the public goods game that we call blood donation? I hope the person who finally understands and goes on to solve this problem for Sri Lanka is out there somewhere listening to this talk today. 
I often hear politicians and other so-called policymakers saying that scientific research should be brought into line with our national development objectives. That applied science is more important than pure science. To be frank, I don't think people who make such claims have a clue about what science is all about. To me at least, science is primarily about being curious, about developing and testing hypotheses and thinking critically about them and then, of course, trying to falsify them. My students all know that the greatest gift they can give me is proving me wrong. And they often do that. I like it when they learn from my mistakes. So to the young scientists amongst you, I urge you to observe what's happening around you, what's going on in the world around you, to think about what it means and to try to understand what's happening. Let me give you an example, a commonplace example, which I'm sure all of you have seen, but perhaps failed to observe. Here are some photos taken at the end of women's finals at Wimbledon. And here are some photos taken at the end of men's finals. Here are the women again and the men. I'm sure that all of you have seen by now the difference between the two sexes. What's going on? The women keep body contact to a minimum while the men are contacting each other with an intimacy that men rarely show in everyday life. Well, I think that this is an excellent research project. Why is the behavior of men and women so different in this setting at the end of a strenuous competitive match? Well, Benenson and Rangham chose to investigate this problem and they tested an interesting evolutionary hypothesis. In the evolutionary context, Men are called upon to cooperate with one another much more than women are. That's how it is that in all hunter-gatherer societies, men hunt in groups. But especially when it comes to mating choices, men come into conflict with each other much more frequently. That is partly why in prisons worldwide there are 20 times more men than women. Benenson and Rangham hypothesized that after conflict, men need to signal affiliation much more strongly than women. Men need to signal that they're at peace once more. Hence, the authors hypothesize the more aggressive the sport, the longer the affiliation should last. After all, at the end of a boxing match, it is not uncommon to see behaviors like this. You don't get this at the end of a game of poker or burua, usually. So they reviewed hours and hours of footage, measured the time for which men and women engaged in affiliation after strenuous sports, and plotted the results. This also has an important lesson for those of us who want to see reconciliation between Tamils and Sinhalese now that the conflict, the civil war, is over. The recipe for affiliation is now clear. Sinhalese and Tamils don't need to hug like boxers and chimps do. Well, they could, but they don't have to. But they could signal their affiliation in other ways. When the apartheid era ended in South Africa, it did so through a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that brought some kind of justice uh, and an apology to finish that dreadful period of South Africa's history. When the Second World War ended, the Allies did the same thing through the Nuremberg trials. Though the Germans killed 40 million people, only 12 Germans received death penalties at Nuremberg. Only seven received life sentences. Yet, that was enough to persuade the families of the millions of survivors that justice had been done. In Sri Lanka, however, we refused to accept that any war crimes were committed, and so we see no need for affiliation. But I doubt whether anyone who witnessed the treatment meted out by the Sinhalese servicemen just a few days ago to Sinhalese participants in the Aragalia will believe that the Tamil civilians in the north were better treated during the war. So the sense of justice, of grievance, gets carried on from generation to generation. It will never heal until affiliation takes place. This is what science shows. Something that we often lose sight of is that we are apes. 
we are nothing more than apes. We do all the things that apes do. Males fight with each other. Males fight with males over females. They gang up to rape females. They engage in war. They torture. They steal. They cheat. They commit infanticide. Even genocide. It isn't only apes that do these things. Many animals, from water beetles to dolphins, engage in such horrible behaviours, including rape. But we humans are better. We are better than our animal relatives in one important respect, or at least we think we are. And that is that we believe that we are virtuous. It is not that we are virtuous, but we believe that we are virtuous. We believe that we are righteous. Api silvat, api dharmishtai. But are we really? You have only to read the famous and beautiful speech made in 1854 by the American Indian chief Seattle to understand what incredible respect our ancestors had for the environment. Seattle made his famous speech in 1854 when the US government wanted to purchase the traditional lands occupied by the Duwamish and the Suquamish tribes, of which he was the leader. I'm going to read you a small extract from that speech. We are part of the earth, and it is part of us. The earth doesn't belong to man. Man belongs to the earth. This we know. All things are connected, like the blood which unites one family. Whatever befalls the earth, befalls the sons of the earth. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. Treat the earth with respect, so that it lasts for centuries to come and is a place of wonder and beauty for our children. What beautiful words. I have heard this passage, this extract, quoted in speeches by many famous people. Vice President Al Gore of the United States, Prince Charles, and numerous environmental leaders in Sri Lanka, including university professors. This quotation distills the essence of the modern environmental movement, our concept of sustainability, of caring for the planet, of conservation. It proves that our ancestors lived in a better world, that their morals and their ethics and their values were so much better than our own. Whereas we exploit nature, they sustained it. Well, I'm sorry to burst the bubble, but Chief Seattle never said any of those things. It's all a big lie. Chief Seattle's so-called speech was in fact written by an American scriptwriter called Ted Perry in 1971, more than 100 years after Chief Seattle had died. Since then, environmentalists who want to show that the past was so much better than the present so much purer than the present, have taken to passing off this piece of fiction as the truth. The beautiful picture those words paint of the past are so comforting, so soothing. A world to which every one of us would like to return. But there never was any such world. It is an absolute fiction that past times were better than present, not just in America, but anywhere including Sri Lanka. Shortly after the first humans entered America 12,000 years ago, three quarters of the large mammal genera disappeared. Mammoths, mastodons, wild horses, saber-toothed cats, wild camels, they all became extinct. The destruction of large mammals in South America was even worse. And the archaeological evidence shows that far from being sustainable, the slaughter was utterly wasteful. A lot of what was killed was never eaten. And the situation in the Pacific Islands was even worse still. As the Polynesians worked their way across the Pacific, they exterminated most of the birds that were big enough to eat. Eventually, they caused the extinction of almost 20% of all bird species on the planet. And in Australia, the carnage was even worse still. As for Sri Lanka, 
because there are so few remains, we really have no idea what happened to the large mammals that were here. What we do know is that many large mammal species that are now extinct, species of elephant, hippopotamus, rhinoceros, the gaur, and so on, persisted on this island until the time when early modern humans first arrived, around 60,000 years ago. The reason I'm highlighting this is not to argue that our ancestors were bad people, but to argue that they were no different from us. There's no point in romanticizing this past to argue that in those days people lived long, healthy lives because they ate only organic food. I hear these myths increasingly repeated even by scientists and doctors nowadays. As the Dutch thombos show in the National Archives of Sri Lanka in Colombo, as recently as 300 years ago, it was common for mothers to kill excessive girl children at birth, at least in what is now the Western province. We don't need to base our morality and our ethics on ancient myths, on fictions. We have the best tool that has ever been invented to get us ever closer to the truth, even closer to moral truth and ethical truth. We call that tool science. As you know, the West discovered the scientific method as we know it only in the 17th century. It was only then that it became widely accepted that all things known on the basis of someone else's authority could and should be tested. Those of you who practice Buddhism may have encountered this idea already. It is beautifully preserved, it is wonderfully encapsulated in the Kalama Sutra. It is this single statement that gives Buddhism a claim to being an empirical scientific tradition rather than a religion or even a philosophy. The Royal Society of the United Kingdom is perhaps the most eminent scientific association in the world. It was founded in London in 1660 by people of the standing of Isaac Newton and Robert Boyle. The motto they chose for the society was in Latin, nullius in verba, meaning take nobody's word for it. The Kalama Sutra in its essence says exactly that. If only we had applied the lessons of this wonderful teaching of Buddhism to evaluate the statements of Professor Channa Jayasumana when he was telling COVID patients to take the Dhammikapaniya, or to Dr. Anuruddha Padenia when he was encouraging the government to ban agrochemicals, to Treasury Secretary Dr. P.B. Jayasundara when he slashed taxes on the grounds that it would somehow boost the economy, or to Central Bank Governor Professor W.D. Lakshman when he was printing trillions of rupees while claiming that there is no causal link between money supply and inflation. All these people were acting on the authority that they had by virtue of being experts. They were the authorities. If only we had applied the principle of the Kalama Sutra and questioned their judgments, however well qualified, however authoritative they were, we would not be in this mess today. I think it is strange that in a country that is predominantly Buddhist, so few people meditate seriously, and so few scientists study the meditating mind. This is one of the most fascinating things about being in Sri Lanka, in this Buddhist milieu. In fact, I might even take the risk of saying that I don't see any point in Buddhism in the absence of meditation. But meditation leads you to discovering truly profound truths about the mind, about your mind. The realization that the self is an illusion, for example, is a hugely consequential discovery, a discovery that Western neurobiologists are only now beginning to unpack. What I refer to as the self is the thing that seems to lurk inside your head, thinking your thoughts, having a perpetual conversation with yourself feeling your experiences and emotions and so on. The self is a funny thing and it's very difficult for us to let go of the idea that it exists because it doesn't. In fact, you and I are nothing more than collections of symbiotic molecules. Get used to it. 
Another thing that arises from meditation is the ability to observe our thoughts as they arise in consciousness. You cease to be the thinker of your thoughts and become instead the observer of your thoughts. And finally, the realization that reality itself is an illusion. It's one of the most profound teachings of Buddhism and it's one of the most profound experiences of meditation. What we think of as reality is little more than a construction of the brain. The great philosopher Descartes observed in relation to what it means to exist, I think, therefore I am. But I think people who meditate find a different reality, the reality that Buddhism teaches. Thoughts arise in consciousness, giving the illusion that I exist, because I don't really exist. I don't really exist my body does. These are difficult ideas to put into words. You can approach these ideas only empirically through meditation and for many of us, including me, meditation is difficult and frustrating. When you first attempt it and try to focus your mind on your breathing, you find it impossible to do so for more than a few seconds. Until you try it, you will never accept just how difficult it is. But I think the opportunities for deep research into the mind that meditation offers, especially in Sri Lanka because of the traditions that surround us, should be exploited by scientists in this country, in which the Buddhist tradition is so deeply entrenched. Before I move on, I want to invite you to do two things that will help you get a glimpse of what I'm trying to say about reality being an illusion. As you witness the world through your eyes, you think you are seeing reality, but you are not and you can prove it to yourself. I think you'd all have learned at school about the blind spot in your field of vision, in your eye. Otherwise, go to YouTube and learn how to find it. You never consciously observe that it is there until you try to find it for yourself. If you have done that already, well, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that all the time you see the world, you don't see what's in the blind spot of your eyes? but your brain just makes it up for you, your brain creates your reality. Watch me now, pay attention to my eyes as I move them, as I pan them from left to right as smoothly as I can. You see that as hard as I try, my eyes are not panning smoothly from left to right, but in short jerks. We call these jerky movements saccades. Yet I don't notice any jerkiness in my vision. My brain smooths it out. In other words, my brain is hiding reality from me. You can try another one, but it takes a few seconds to do it later. Put a single full stop on your computer screen. Close one eye and focus your other eye carefully only on the spot, without allowing your eye to wander about. If you do it right and you hold your attention on just the spot in a few seconds because your eye is not saccading, your whole field of vision collapses and disappears around you and you see something like this. Which then is the reality, the white screen or the black screen? Your eyes are seeing the same screen. To the young scientist listening in today, if you take one lesson from this talk, please make it this. Every time you hear an extraordinary claim, demand to see extraordinary evidence. Sometimes even simple claims are worth actually testing. Is one plus one really equal to two? Well, to us it may seem obvious, but to the mathematicians Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead, it wasn't. They decided to try to prove this in their famous book, Principia Mathematica. And finally, it was only on page 379 that they were able to do so. Before I leave the subject of authority, I want to give you one more example because it's fun. Some of the best-selling books in the world today are so-called self-help books books on how to lead a fitter, healthier, happier life. Here's a selection of the best-selling self-help books in the United States a few years ago. 
Many people buy these books and follow their recommendations on diet and exercise, hoping to live longer, healthier lives. But when I see such books, I like to first test whether they really worked, well at least for their authors, whether they work for the people that wrote them. First of all, remember that the average life expectancy in the United States is 78 years. So if these books really work, their authors should live considerably longer than that. Well, here are the ages at which each of the authors died. Not one of them lived to 78. So much for authority. Now I know that at least some of you have been kicking your heels impatiently and saying, Ayo, this fellow is 30 minutes into his talk already and he has not said a single thing about what the title says. The role of science in Sri Lanka's rise from the ashes. But if you thought I was going to come here and read out a shopping list of research projects you should do to help us recover from this crisis, well, no, I'm not going to do that. What I've tried to do instead is to let my mind wander across some interesting ideas. Well, ideas that I find interesting and allow your mind to think its own thoughts. A sort of guided meditation on science. But if there's one piece of advice that I want to give you as we strive to lift our country out of this mess, it is that whenever and wherever you see or hear irrational or ignorant ideas of the kind that got us into this mess, don't be afraid to call them out, to criticize. Even if it is not in your field of specialization, you must speak out because you're scientists and you're rational. You have critical thinking skills. Most of us who do research in the basic sciences, mathematics, physics, chemistry, biology, are also engaged in teaching. So you must remember, you should remember, that increasing poverty as a result of this crisis will affect education outcomes as well. Sri Lankan youngsters had a serious cognitive skills deficit even before we went into this crisis. We know that children who suffer under nutrition in their first five years or whose mothers are undernourished can expect an IQ deficit of as much as seven points. Nationally, malnutrition amongst zero to five-year-olds was already 15% by 2019. Now, with many parents unable to afford a balanced diet for their children, that could double. We risk raising a generation of youth with severely impaired cognitive skills. To put it bluntly, we risk raising a generation of losers. We must exert all the scientific muscle we possess, all the influence we have to address this emergency. Sadly, another famous experiment in psychology shows that once people, and even other animals, believe that they are helpless, they will do nothing to help themselves. They just go into despair. They give up. I'm referring to the so-called learned helplessness experiment of Martin Seligman in 1965 and the huge body of follow-up work that stemmed from that. No problem is more relevant to the return of Sri Lanka to development and prosperity than enhancing the cognitive skills of our children. The only way we can do that is through eliminating undernutrition and preventing childhood illness. As scientists, we are supposed to be the thought leaders of this country. What does that leadership mean? What value does it have? if we fail our people now. Thank you.